Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Wherever you are around the world, it is a pleasure to welcome you back to the Light 'em Up Lounge. It's Wednesday. Time for cigar, time for another live show, time for another inspiring and incredible craftsman and amazing guest for today's show. I am delighted, I'm honored and very happy to welcome John Van Tintelen from Van Tintelen Printing Arts with us today. So we'll take a slightly different perspective on the cigar industry today when, as you all know, most often we talk to manufacturers and brand owners. Today we'll take a little bit of a behind the scenes look, not only in terms of manufacturing cigars, the blending and all that, but the artistic component that ultimately beautifully dresses and decorates the wonderful cigars that we all love and enjoy. As always, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to put them underneath the Facebook live stream. I'm always checking over there and uh, trying to forward your questions to John. For all of you here at the lounge, please make yourselves heard. We'd love to hear your questions. So without further ado, John, welcome to Light Em Up and thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, the, the list that you, of people that you have had on the show uh, quite amazing. So uh, it's it's it's. Uh, I feel humble that that you that you guys invite me to do this. Yes, it is an absolute pleasure. And as we as we said in the announcement, uh, a, a wonderful quote that uh, that you told me before uh, we we actually scheduled the show is that. Um, from a very young age on, uh, you started making music, drawing and getting involved with everything that had wheels and made noise. And now here we are talking about cigars, talking about cigar art. Um, how did all that come together from those uh, early beginnings uh, with wheels and noise to one of the finest and most delicate um, components of craftsmanship and art? that not only the cigar industry, but so many other industries have seen and uh, so many amazing projects that you've been working on. Well, how did it all start? Well, it's <clears throat> the, the, the noise thing. Uh, so the interest for everything with wheels and, and, and that kind of stuff uh, came from my, uh, from, my, from my own family. Uh, my father rode a motorcycle from a fairly early age also. So that's, that's something you, uh, you grow into, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother was very involved into music, uh, so combine those two, the, then you got wheels and, and then you got noise. <laughs> so that's basically it. Uh, that's the start of it all. Um, as for uh, becoming a printer, my grandfather was already a printer in 1930, when the family van Tintler was still located in Amsterdam. And uh, he worked for uh, a printing company that did only the printing work for Scandinavian, and uh, now it's Scandinavian Tobacco Group. At that point, mm -hmm. it was a Swedish match company. So they did all the match printing. I still have a ton of those laying around from that era, actually. So it's really cool stuff. But uh, uh, finally, the... Swedish match company said, okay, we make matches in Eindhoven and we do the printing in Amsterdam. So let's pick up that facility and place it to Eindhoven. So that's how we got located in, uh, in Eindhoven, in Brabant, in the Netherlands. Um, so I've always been around with, with printing machines and with motorbikes and with cars and, and with music. Uh, uh, and that's how it all evolved. And of course, when you when you're five years old, you can't ride a bike and you can't <laughs> ride a car. But when I look at my early drawings, uh, especially in agenda from school, it's all drawings from motorcycles, from cars, from guitars, all that kind of stuff. So it um, it was something that was um, yeah, within me already. Yeah, it wasn't forced into me. Let 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 me explain it like that. Yeah. It, it's wonderful, I, I guess, when you when you can say that something like this evolves so naturally, and you 
you grow into that role, but you also have it in your DNA and in your blood. And it's not something that, that you're being forced into. And, and especially like a, a family operation, like a Ventintel and printing art, I assume that makes it even more special when you can look back to, to the heritage and the legacy that the family has built. And then you, you continue that path into a prosperous future. Yeah, that's true. But that's something that you learn to appreciate later on. Mm -hmm. I mean, I started out as a printer when I was 16 years old. Uh, I wanted to become a professional, uh, professional printer as, as soon as I could, because I really enjoyed it. I, uh, my father's first own company, he started when I was 11 years old. So at that point uh, in the weekends, I was already there. Not just for the printing, I got to be honest, I took my bicycle apart and all the kind of stuff and did painting already. And, but um, it, it really became natural to me, uh, the, the, the smell of paper, the smell of ink, all that, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so, um, John, can you, you still up... recall, like, what was it that really captured your attention or that that made you passionate about those things was it like a sensory component when you say like you, the the smell of the paper and the ink or was it the the crafts component of doing something with your hands that you can feel or was it truly that you had the inspiration from your family and and seeing your father getting getting into all that um well, to be honest, I've, I've never seen my grandfather at a printing machine, so that's not from him. And by the time that my father uh, had his own company, um, he was working on the machines, but not, not quite as lot as, as, as in the early days, of course. I mean, when you run a company, well, uh, you've got to do so many things, uh, and, and uh, it's very easy to become drawn from, from that part. But I always really liked that part. Uh, and the thing that I like the most is you, you start uh, you start with a with a white canvas, uh, a white actually a white piece of paper, and each step of the way you, you see it build up, and that's something that that uh, that you can do with a lot of things. Uh, when you record music, you can do drums first, and then guitar, and then bass, and eventually it will becomes a tune. And with printing, it's the same thing. You can add colors, and when you don't like it, you say, okay, let's add another color. Mm -hmm. That is specifically how it was done in the early days in the stone print. Um, they kept adding colors. Uh, when you take those early cigar bands or labels for that matter, they all pop because of the hideous, hideous amount of colors that they, that they used at that point, because uh, time, time was cheap then. So when it wasn't good enough, okay, do some more. So seeing a white piece of paper evolving into, into a nice wine label or whiskey, or because that was the stuff that we really did in the beginning uh, a lot as well. Um, so the, the, the becoming of, of something and being able to adapt it. Uh, when, you, when, when, uh, when you build a motorbike, you can, in the meantime, when you take a test drive, you don't like it. You can add some things. You can you can change the carburetor. You can fine tune the, the the suspension. All that kind of stuff. So the the whole trip from the beginning to the end. That's yeah. That's for me the nicest thing. That's that's beautiful, and and I love the way you you describe that. Um, at at what point did cigars creep into the overall picture and became another component of that journey? Well, that was really, that's, that's really easy, actually. Um, because when my father started his, uh, his company, uh, the majority of what he did uh, was stationary. So business cards and uh, small uh, brochures, all that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. everybody was doing that. Every printing company was doing that. When my father started, he did only the small amounts. And that was... Uh, uh, that was not done very often at that time. And that's how he could build his existence. Um, but very, uh, very soon I became bored with that kind of work. Yeah. 
Uh, and he started in 1980. And in 1983, he got a call from uh, Drukkerij Vrijdag. I think you all know Drukkerij Vrijdag, mm -hmm. which is one of the greatest printing uh, companies in the world. Uh, and they were looking at a small facility to do their tiny projects. And so together, uh, the formal owner, uh, Together with my father, they set up a company that did specifically that, only that. So only the small assignments for them. So that's how I became known with, uh, at that time, it, 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 it was 50-50, I think. A lot of uh, whiskey labels, a lot of uh, uh, cigarettes. I mean, at that time, uh, Friday was, was, was in the dog food and cat food as well. So they did a lot of things. They still do a lot of things. But the, 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 all the steps you had to do to make a great band, that was what uh, attracted me the most. Mm -hmm. And so that was the path for me to go. I knew that from a very early age on, yeah. Why was the cigar world different from all those other industries that you had experienced before? Was it the art? Was it the, the, the very restricted, um, like space that you could play with. So I, I would assume it becomes even more complicated because it's so small little details and, and fine craftsmanship. But yeah. then, as we yeah. all know, the, the spirit, the community, the camaraderie of the cigar industry is something unique that you probably don't find in many other industries. What was that pull factor for you that, that you very much enjoyed about this particular ecosystem? Well, that's an easy answer as well. When you bring someone the 500 business card, they say, oh, that's good, that's nice. Okay, nice. But when you bring someone his first cigar band and you fiddled around with it for, for uh, days, really days, uh, they pick it up and they go like, let me get someone. They pick it up and they, 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 they look for every single detail, every... Uh, and not only on the front, on the back as well. So um, you 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 got to know that that the image that is on the box that is usually this wide, and you got to scale it down to something this big, and still being able to see all the details, still being able to read it, and all that kind of stuff, and the positioning, everything has to be spot on. So it, it, uh, to me, this makes the most pleasure to make. So that's why uh, I ended up saying, let's go with that. Let's only do that. And we still do some, uh, some yeah, like caviar, but only high end products. Yeah. Because those people really appreciate the amount uh, of time and the effort that you put into it. Is, is that something where, where you would say the cigar industry truly differs from, from some absolutely. of the Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you, you have to be a trained cigar smoker to see without a band what kind of cigar it is. And you can see how well it's put together and all that kind of stuff. But, but, but yeah, take it off, take the band off and... and I'm not saying it becomes another smoke, but it certainly becomes another appearance. It's very true. And uh, for me, coming from the sensory, the multi-sensory experience world, I, I cannot state often enough how much the surrounding factors uh, make for the overall cigar experience. And it's, it's fascinating how colors and visuals could even impact your immediate olfactory and, and gustatory sensation. So you, you wouldn't even believe, and we, we did experiments on this and, and uh, I wrote articles in Cigar Journal about this, how even the color of the ring could change your overall perception of the cigar because it's our sensory system is is, is a holistic ecosystem and everything comes comes into play and, and, and has a major role. That's yeah, that's that's the way it works. Ever since 
Ever since cavemen, the one with the biggest cave, uh, got the women. <laughs> <You mean? laughs> it's, 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 it's what appeals to the eye, of course. And a train cigar uh, smoker knows exactly, of course, okay, uh, it might have a nice band, but I don't like the taste. I don't like the blend that's been done. Uh, it's a crappy put together cigar that can happen yeah. as well. So that's a responsibility for me as well. Eh? So um, for me trying to, uh, and that sounds a bit arrogant, but uh, uh, trying to pick out the cigar makers that actually make good cigars. And I'm not a cigar smoker as well. So for me, that's when I get to know the people and that's only been happening since the last four years that are really, uh, that I'm really getting into this world. Uh, I've been working below the radar since, uh, since my 16th year, uh, 16 year old. So uh, that's becoming, it's becoming more and more obvious now. So now I get to see the people behind the cigar because when I first, went to uh, to Dortmund to the inter uh, to the inter tabac. Uh, I've I've known uh, I've worked for uh, Ernesto. I worked for Padron. I worked for uh, for Fuenta. I worked for uh, uh, um, Cohiba, Padomo, uh, for Davidov, Monte Cristo. You name it. But I couldn't tell which was who. I never knew who was behind it because we all did those assignments for the larger printing company. Yeah. Can you give us a little bit of an insight how that process normally works when, when you start to, to collaborate um, or you work on a new uh, cigar project? Um, how, like, is, is there a standard pathway for the, for the creative process and how you get together? Would most of the manufacturers come with a very strong idea or or an exact uh, you know draft uh, or is it truly the, the the input that you can provide and the experience that you have from your expertise that changes the whole dynamic of the process well of course i know what's technically possible but uh, every time it it, it it keeps surprising me that uh, the way it's being presented is always different you got people who know exactly what they want mm -hmm. and you can shift really quick. And you got people also who are saying, I'm uh, looking for a new cigar band. So what does it cost? So actually asking that question. Okay. And then we get into the details. What do you want? Do you have something in mind? Do you have a design? Do you, uh, do you have a designer? Uh, do you want to uh, participate in the designing? So when you got people like, like um, I'm not going to name any names, but you got a lot of people who know exactly what they want. And that works really quick. But they are in the uh, cigar industry for so long or, or, uh, or they have some, 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 some graphical influences. So they, they, they know what they like. They really know what they like. And when you know what you like, you can give specific orders. And that's the way it works quicker. But uh, I, I got people coming in with uh, with a part of their car to, to match the cigar band with the color of the car. So it, 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 it variates. Yeah. And that's what the nicest thing is. It's never the same. It's never the same. Do you sometimes experience projects where, as you mentioned, somebody comes with a very strong idea and they have, uh, you know, all the designs laid out and everything seems easy, but then you have to tell them, look, that's all nice and fussy and fluffy, but it's never going to work uh, from a technical perspective. Uh, two weeks ago, about two or three weeks ago, uh, I got an, uh, a question from a person who wanted hot foil on a transparent a cigar band, which basically needs to be from plastic. And he, the design was completely ready and all the kind of stuff. So I said, okay, it, it, it looks really cool to me, but how are you going to put a plastic band around the cigar? So I ended up making an email, which took me about, I think, 45 minutes to explain what, what, what could go wrong. Uh, and, uh, and and gave him several options to to do it in a in a different way, and that it still would look the same. Because 
I could see from the mock-up that he did, he was already in for it for a lot of money. So mm-hmm. then you try to help someone. You always try to help someone, but this, this, this man was way off. And I think probably by the designers who had a terrific idea. But you, 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 you can't glue a piece of plastic to your cigar. Not as a band. I mean, you got people who smoke it all the way to the band. Okay, let, let that be a plastic band. You're going to have a very funny taste on your cigar, I think. So, uh, so it, that happens. Yeah. Over the course of the years, when and with, with all the experience that you have in the industry, would you say there are certain trends um, and and you know particular styles that you would probably associate with, with an era or a particular time? Like in, in former days, everybody tried to do X and then they shifted to Y. Um, because in, in the industry with the cigars, you see that a lot. Uh, yeah. One year, everybody needs to have a Connecticut shade wrapped cigar, and then it's it's all broadleaf, and the next year, Mexican San Andres. Yeah. Yeah. Do you yeah. have yeah. that yeah. with the art as well? With the art, that's exactly the same thing. In the beginning, uh, when we did the first uh, Opus X, everybody wanted to have that paper. Everybody wanted to have that paper. Uh, and, and now, uh, later on, uh, I think over the last five years, there, uh, the coloring of the bands uh, go from neon to, to completely gold. Mm-hmm. I mean, completely gold. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's, um, yes, it, 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 it diverses a lot. Yeah. There are still some people who like to hang on to uh, the old school stuff. Um, and when they ask me to do a design, I always do exactly what they want and do a couple of designs extra to, to push them in another direction or, or show them what is, uh, what is possible also. Because uh, heavy coloring is, is, is an option these days, no problem. Which of the individual components do you think has the most impact on the way that the cigar is ultimately dressed? Is it the paper? Is it the, the print? Is it the tactile sensation even? What are some of the little details that people probably overlook when they, when they grab a cigar and strip off the ring and, and throw it into the ashtray? Well, I think the uh, cigar band with the most details in it uh, are being overlooked. Because there's so much going on, you don't know where to look. And if you take, for instance, a Davidoff band, you can tell from, from, from 15 meters that someone is smoking a cigar, a Davidoff cigar. And it only contains white paper, uh, gold foil, embossing, and a very special cutting that exactly fits the oval from, uh, from the design. So that is very noticeable. Although it's not such a difficult band design-wise, it's very difficult to make. That's what it is. Because when you're out of sync within a tenth of a millimeter, you can see it immediately. Uh, so I think that the more details that are in the cigar band, the more they get overlooked. There's too mm-hmm. much going on sometimes. So that's, that's usually the largest part of my work when artwork comes in where a designer has been working on a cigar band that eventually will end up will end up this big, but he has made it on this screen. So the, what can you usually there's a lot of things that, that, uh, that is going on uh, that can't be detailed into uh, an embossing tool. Mm-hmm. So it's the, 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 uh, the most challenging thing to do is to down tune all the uh, uh, all the all the too many details, but still keep the design. Uh, uh, it should be in a matter that the customer doesn't see that I fiddled around with it. <laughs> John uh, Albert over on Facebook um, posted a question, and he wanted to know what was the most difficult band for you to print and die cut. That's coming out very soon. So if he's a little bit patient, a little bit patient, I've been working on the project since April 
2019. Uh, by now, that's the most difficult band ever to produce for me. Yeah, it, it contains so many steps. Um, and it's not exaggerated with details, but um, I think within a couple of months, it, it, it'll come out. And that's all I can say about it. That was, that's an answer to the question. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that he, he doesn't have an image with it to go. Um, uh, but that's still to come out. Um, and one step lower uh, than that, in the early days, uh, when Gurkha cigars started, they always had very, very challenging uh, designs, and those were really difficult to make. So I got us, and Gurkha is is the one that taught me how to uh, downsize artwork and still maintain the the, the 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 look and the feel of the band. And they use like a ton of foil on on on. They, they use sometimes four different shades of gold foil on one cigar band, and you, and those are all separate steps. So you have to be able to make it fit all together. So with the coloring, with the cutting, three kinds of four kinds of gold foil, and in the end, still being able to uh, that it all fits together. So Gurkha were for me the most challenging bands to do. Yeah. Until. And the next one that will come out in a couple of months. Can you can you share some some thoughts as to why that new project is so particularly challenging, or what are the intricate details that make it so so hard? Um, well, the guy who ordered them um, was a very. Uh, we we both designed the band actually. We got together. Uh, and we we so it it happens sometimes that 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 you get together with a customer and then uh, okay you share the screen and all that kind of stuff and then you do okay you place that there place that there but uh, this guy I'm talking about we really had an an instant click so we had a good chemistry going on and we started to uh, do a couple of meetings and in those meetings the the Roughly 70% of the design was finished. And then we started to, <clears throat> to do some testing. And it evolved. And it took about one and a half year before the first test was completed. Um, it's very challenging, very challenging to do, but you will see it when it comes out. It's, it's, uh, it's truly amazing. And it's the most expensive band we've ever made. Yeah. That is actually a wonderful segue into a question that Steve Newman posted on Facebook. What would be the price range for a band project? And, and I know this is an impossible question to answer because it's pretty much from A to, to Z, but could you give us a, a rough estimation for, for all the people watching who love cigars? and who have no idea whatsoever about uh, the, the, the labor involved and the cost with, with such a project. What are we looking at? Um, well, of course, the, 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 you have to uh, notice one thing. To start up a machine takes just the same amount of time when you're going to produce one band or a million bands. You have to order the same. Okay, you can order a smaller tool, of course. But when you know, uh, for instance, when you, when you want to order 5,000 cigar bands with foil, with embossing, with cutting, so whether you order thousands of those or 5,000 of those, I still would have to buy the foil tool, the embossing tool, the cutting tool. All the digital stuff has to be done. Uh, the design has to be done. And then when you take all those costs, and I think for 5,000 bands, uh, within three colors, gold foil, embossing, cutting, I think it will set you back somewhere around 1,500 and 2,000 euros for 5,000 bands. But when you would order seven and a half thousand bands, it would only add 100 euros. Mm -hmm. So it's the first startup cost that, uh, and of course, when you go crazy on the design, that's hideous expensive as well. Yeah. So for instance, 
when you do like 200,000 bands with existing tools, it will set you back about 0 0.03 cents a band. That's nothing. And the band we were just talking about is over 30 cents each. So you can go nuts. You can go nuts. When someone decides it would be nice to have a, a, a diamond in the center of my cigar band. <coughs> then it goes up and it can be done. It can be done. So there you go. It, it can go from uh, point, uh, 0.45 cents to, uh, yeah. I think it's so fascinating how much detail and how many little components you can put into such a super small piece of printing art and, and ultimately create a, a holistic experience. It's, it's fascinating. Well, it, it, and of course, it, it, it all depends uh, how far you want to go. Um, in the early days, everything had to be done by hand. Everything. So now into the digi digital world, uh, it's getting more and more uh, well easy to do. But design-wise, you're, you're still... Uh, that's a thing that happens in the mind that, that still takes the same amount of time to create something. But then, for instance, an, an embossing tool, and I've got one here laying. This is one for so one for testing quite a long time ago. This is an embossing tool completely made by a computer. Oh. So, so, so I did the artwork, um, and a friend of mine uh, uh, engraved it. OK. Only machine, no hand. No hands. Okay. But then in the early days, and they still do, they make this by hand. So somebody's actually cutting this out with a tool. And, and these go over a couple of thousand euros. Only this. And then you've got nothing. You only got this. But this is way much nicer. This lives. When you see a band produced with this, with this kind of tool, it, it lives. Because uh, we have, we as human have, have imperfections that makes it perfect at the end. It's the same way when you put on a computer, a drum computer. And when you do, when you let a human do that, it's a different feel. And this will, this will never, this will never go away. Never. John, I'm, I'm a drummer myself, uh, and ah. uh, I, 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 I feel every every word that you say. Um, now, it, th that takes me to to my next question, and um, related to to something Albert just posted on Facebook, uh, he was interested if cigar bands printing use laser etching and printing, or if it's still done with ink, for example. And I guess the answer is both, probably. The answer is both. Uh, the only problem is that the, the printing machines, the laser printing machines, uh, do not have the precise enough alignment to do the further steps. So when you print it, then, then it's done. You, you can't uh, apply an embossing or a foil on that because it will it will jiggle. Mm -hmm. It's not going to fit. When you could implement that in the same machine and doing it at the same time, then you're good to go. But then you would really have a machine who could do the foiling, the printing, and the cutting uh, in one step. The moment the sheet of paper will have to be transferred to another machine, it's out of, it's out of position. And they are getting better at that. I'm sure there will come a time that they will nail it. But to be honest, uh, who's going to invest into a machine who does cigar bands? I am going to, but the, 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 the market itself, I mean, no, no. The machine market, the way it is, no, it's not going to invest in that. Who will say that in five years we'll need to go to plain packaging? 
I'm sure that's never going to happen uh, in, in total because in some countries it, it, it's already going on, but they they won't be able to do that globally. No. And I will still be producing bands because it's 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 not illegal to produce bands. You could put them around it yourself at home. Very true. Um, well, I, I would love to explore your opinion about the the whole regulatory looming threat and how that might affect the the industry and your business in particular. But um, going back to the to the machinery and and looking at it with with a more holistic perspective you love restoring things uh, you you obviously have a passion for the the trusted and true craft and and manufacturing things whilst at the same time there's always something new coming there's evolution in the machinery um and interestingly enough i mean that that's the entire essence and the dynamic of the cigar industry this is one of the most old school traditional still 100% handmade industries and products that is yeah. so unique today and 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 that's part of the charm of the industry but it's also challenged by the disruption even of the 21st century digitalization yep. everything that's going on now yep. how do you combine that where, where do you find that middle ground where do you find that fine balance between the the dynamic and the interest and of, of something new but then the old school and the trusted and true well as long as as uh, as i have customers that will uh, appreciate what we do and not just go for a print, then we're good to go. Listen, the moment we all decide to buy a Tesla, the combustion engine is gone. Mm. So as long as people like to hear a roar or whatever, that's, that's, that's really what I, all I can say about it. As long as people appreciate what we do and feel the need to dress that cigar in that way, uh, not looking at it like uh, some sort of sleazy print, then, yeah. And there will always be people who appreciate luxury in any form or shape. Very true. I'm, I'm, I'm not too worried about that, no. But in, in general, would you say that you cling more towards the the old school machinery and the, the, yes. the stuff yes. that still makes noise, you know, the rustle and bustle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah hundred yeah, year yeah. old machine compared to a new laser etching and, and modern yeah, stuff. Yeah, okay, but you can okay, but you can combine those things. I have seven machines here, which are all adapted by me. Uh, and and I got forced into come up with a way to align different processes because of the designs becoming more and more interested, uh, interesting and difficult. So I thought there must be a way to, to eliminate uh, the, 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 as we call it, the finger spits gefühl. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I came up with an idea uh, and, and uh, interpreted that into all those machines, which makes it uh, much more, uh, uh, it makes it a bit quicker to produce, it makes it safer to produce, because these are really old school machines. Eh? Uh, when you would jump into the machine, it, it wouldn't even say, huh. it would squeeze you to death. So much power goes on in that machine. So we need that kind of machinery to, you, 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 uh, you have to transform paper into a shape between a father and a mother die. And that you need to really apply a lot of pressure. Uh, and that will always be have to uh, made on the same way. The industry does have new machinery, but they're all based on big sizes very big size uh, and paper is made out of wood and wood does work so a piece of paper during the process of printing and foiling and bronzing and lacquering it will do like this and when you want to make all the steps that you do 
you want to you want them all to fit you have to work in small pieces of paper now you don't have to i chose to work in small sizes of paper which is a lot more work because it, it, it takes two three four times as much as work but the result is visible the result is absolutely visible but the the, the machine uh, the machine industry doesn't provide the, these kinds of machines anymore uh, in a smaller scale and that's logic that's logic you, you just mentioned other printing companies and uh, other players in the industry um, Steve posted a, a very interesting question on on Facebook whether is there actually something like a community of cigar ring designers or people who are within that same niche of the industry and do no, you but communicate with each other is there some some form of, of an exchange of ideas and and, and innovation there uh, well I, I I know uh, I wouldn't call it a community but um, because a lot of those people are competitors of course um, but I'm always in the best seat because I have to make it. So uh, the, the, I want to keep them as a friend and they want to keep me as a friend. I talk a lot with designers um, about stuff that they gave to me, what doesn't work and what does work. Uh, what can we implement to still leave your design the way it is, but actually technically, it's, it's, it's a lot different, but you won't be able to tell. So um, in the cigar industry, there are a couple of guys that are well known. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but the cigar world is, is, is a big pool. It's, it's big enough. There's, uh, uh, there's place enough for a lot of fishermen. Mm -hmm. No problem. Yeah. Brian is here with us at the lounge. Brian, you had a question. Welcome, buddy. Hello. Good, uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Very yeah, yeah. Nice. Perfect. Okay. I wasn't sure about my headphones. Um, you got a new uh, backdrop. Was, what happened to the patio I, and all the green? Well, I'm still in the yard. I'm on the patio. I'm just on the, the steps into the, the house here. We're, we're kind of rearranging the yard and do it. we are doing some landscaping. And so I'm, I'm out of my home. I'm displaced for the moment, but it's okay. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Thanks. Uh -huh. So. Um, I, I wouldn't usually go off topic so much with this question because, of course, we're, we should be talking about cigars and, and bands and things, but it, it's come up several times now, discussions about cars and things. So I'm a huge uh, World Rally uh, Championship fan. And, of course, my favorite drivers are the Scandinavians, right? The sport is huge uh, there. So, okay, yeah, yeah. question one, okay, are you a fan? And in terms of, because moments ago you were just talking about technology and Teslas and and cars that, that make noise. What are your thoughts on the new rally hybrid era? Uh, this is out of my league, what you're questioning now. <laughs> no, uh, um, of course, I, I, I know some things about Formula One uh, because of Max Verstappen, of course. But further than that, no, I'm, uh, I'm not an enthusiastic uh, guy in watching sports. But I'm into driving cars and driving motorcycles. No, it, it's for me. It's better to do than to watch. <laughs> gotcha. That's why. Okay. That's not, that's why I don't watch porn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Good luck with the yard. Eh? <laughs> Thanks. Now, John, if if, if we look at the at the business and 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 your company yet again um it's a true family operation there and um so many of the of the great cigar companies are still family-owned businesses and operations uh, i mean just last week uh, we had uh, enrique sejas uh, from matilde um, and and he spoke so fondly about the inspiration from his father and how he was trying to to grow into those massive footsteps how is it for you um working alongside family on a daily basis um uh, for me it was a total new experience and here's why my father was always at work 
so actually, I really got to know him when I started to work for him, with him, I must say. So he started the company in 1980, and I was 11 years old then, 12, uh, 11, uh, no, 12. And when I got to work for him, I was 17 years old, 16, 17 years old. Um, and from that moment on, he became the person that I would see the most for the rest of my life. Because when we started out, we started out with two. It's my father and me. And later on, my brother came to it. Uh, uh, some other uh, uh, colleagues uh, added it. We're now with a, with a club of se uh, seven people. So still a small company. Um, and I'm trying to keep it this way at a maximum of 10. I think it's, it's still manageable and it's still fun. And that's for me the most important thing, fun. Uh, but to work with family is never a problem. A problem uh, has never been a problem for me. My brother all, uh, also worked at the Harley Davidson shop. He's in the same band as I do. Um, he rides motorcycles as well. He plays bass guitar. Uh, so, so uh, uh, Besides the fact that he's that that he's a brother, uh, he's a great friend as well. And I've always seen my father as as a colleague. And when you would start to work with with whatever kind of relative you're working with, you gotta uh, let it go that it's a relative. That's not relevant anymore. When you want to do your job properly, you gotta be able to tell. Okay, this 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 sucks. Instead of no, Dad, I think it's... Uh, no, you got to be honest. And we're from Amsterdam, so we're face-to-face. -face. We're spill our guts. I grew up in a, in a, in a place of Netherlands where it's, it's, it's a little bit different. So we really had to adapt there. But uh, uh, I heard from Calito Fuente, he said, uh, you people I, are a little bit like New Yorkers. I've never been to New York, so I don't know if that's the case. But uh, yeah. You have to spill your guts when you're working with your family. I think you always need to spill your guts. Yeah. Yes. Especially when you were, uh, listen, in, 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 in those early days, I've worked with my father for more than over uh, 12 to 13 hours a day. And then see your wife uh, four hours a day. So, yeah. so, so there you go. Do you feel like it, it changed? your family relationship with, with your father absolutely. as well? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah. What about the succession plan? I mean, you, you're the father of, of two daughters. Um, do, do you see some, some interest in them to, to also venture into the family business? No, no, they're not gonna do that, no. They like it, they love everything we do. I just took them on a trip. Uh, to London, eh, where I was invited to the home house. Uh, that was the first that I took them abroad for a cigar event. Uh, they really loved it. They haven't seen that before. Uh, they're used, as I was, uh, to my father uh, always working. Um, uh, I didn't do it as much uh, without the girls as my father did w without us. I always took them with, uh, with me here. And then the weekend, it was all about the girls. Uh, so they knew what I was doing. But this part, especially over the last three years that I'm coming out and do things like this. Uh, this is the second time I'm doing something like this. And I'm sure they're watching, hey girls. So uh, it, it definitely changed the, the, the relationship between me and my father. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, but, but, and, and I mean, listen, who spends more than 13 hours a day with his father? You? No, do you? No. I don't. So no. you really get to know each other. Which can be a blessing and a burden at the same time. Huh? You, know, you said it, and it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you learn stuff you, uh, you would normally not know from each other. And um, and when you do a business together, that's a good thing. 
John, if I, if I remember correctly from, from the research and uh, from what you told me before as well, I believe you had several offers for the company to be taken over or uh, the yeah. opportunity to, to sell the company, yet you always refused to. Was there ever a moment when you thought about uh, the quick exit and uh, no, spending no, the, no. the rest of your life uh, leisurely on the beach? No, with the no, in no, no. The problem is that I don't give a shit about money, so that that <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't have a hold on me. No. So, uh, and number two is it, it still makes too much fun to me to do. I can I can't imagine uh, not not doing this. No. So at a very, very early age, uh, I was asked uh, to collaborate with, with other companies, uh, w which we did. Uh, the TSO, I don't know if you guys know the TSO, from the family Nike, is a very great company as well, uh, was very involved in, in the cigar business, they still are. Uh, three brothers, Family Nikens, very nice people. They uh, really uh, did a, 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 an enormous uh, task for, for our company. We've been working for them since 1985 and still do. So, um, so yes, um, I, I still love it too much. Uh, I love it too much to sell it. So hasn't come to my mind yet. No. Now, when you look ahead into the future of the cigar industry and how it would ultimately affect your business, what's the perspective there? I mean, currently we're experiencing a boom with the incredible numbers of cigars being brought into the United States. Um, Internationally, in the Eastern Hemisphere, there's empty humidor shelves because uh, yeah. everybody yeah. has issues with, with supply and demand now. Um, but um, do you think that this is sustainable on the one hand? And then, of course, um, we, we mentioned the regulatory issues before. Um, do you sometimes feel like that could cause a real threat to your business as well? You mean that it's going to go away or eventually it will? It... I, I guess both, right? Because the boom on the one hand, that is something that could level out and come down to probably. It's more going to level out. No question about it. That's, 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 listen, we all know why, uh, uh, how this occurred. Huh? COVID, everybody had to work uh, from home. So instead of smoking two cigars a day, you smoke seven, five, whatever. Uh, but, but that's a big, that's, that's a big difference, of course. So, um, but even before the COVID, it was going up. Mm -hmm. It was going up. So, um, and what is happening now, it's, it's a boom, like in 1983. Uh, that's, that's when it all began, eventually, the, the big boom. Um, I think it, it, it will level out uh, to an extent that, Perhaps people are getting used to smoking five to seven cigars a week and now go back to three or four where in the early days they used to do two. I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's, it's not, it's not going to go this way. And there's another problem. It's not just tobacco and wood and, 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 uh, uh, and, and all, all kinds of other supplies. Paper. Listen, normally I would pick up the phone or the paper. And within three days, I would have it here. And now I have several uh, orders that still have to come in that were uh, ordered three months ago. I still have some paper. And, and, and uh, luckily, what what I need to order uh, is still available, but at some point, I think it's going to get tricky. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when that is, I don't know. And I rather don't know. Now, let's assume that supply and demand issues and global supply chains will eventually find a way to to figure themselves out. Um, what probably will not go away as easily 
is the whole regulatory issue. And you, you, you mentioned plain packaging um, earlier, and uh, we all know that it's, it's becoming a reality in certain markets. Um, Australia and New Zealand, um, and now recently, I, I believe even the Netherlands um, suggested that uh, they might stop all tobacco-related products for yeah. people yeah. born after a certain year. Yeah. Um, yeah. What could that potentially mean to, to a business like yours? And, and, and how do you prepare for um, a more heavily regulated cigar landscape further down the road? Well, uh, that's that's a big uh, load to, to carry for just a small printer. Right? I mean, that's there's nothing I can do about it. Um, we still have three printers in the Netherlands who do this kind of work, uh, and I'm the only uh, family business still left over. Uh, Friday has been taken over partially. Uh, TSO has been taken over. Christel is uh, bankrupt. Uh, so, uh, listen. It, the whole cigar industry has left. There are a couple small ones. Okay, but uh, Henry Wintermans is already gone. Agio, we all know the story. It's, 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 well, it's not gone, but it's gone from the Netherlands. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the production facility that was just completely new, re, uh, new rebuilt. Uh, there was a really nice factory. Uh, been taken over by STG. Uh, the production plant has been transferred to Westerlo. Um, and on the Dominican Republic, it, it had some, uh, it had some uh, effects as well. Um, so the industry, as it was, is, is, is gone. It's gone. So I have to go to abroad to, to sell some cigar bands. Mm -hmm. I used to hop into my car, and in 35 minutes, I was at Agio really nice people like, like like us talking to each other about printing printing work and all that kind of stuff it's all gone um well it's not gone but it's out of the netherlands um what will it does eventually to me listen there will always be countries that that uh where we can sell cigar bands to and and i'm not that worried I've I've got uh, we're a total of seven people here. When you got like hundred people on the floor, and and eighty percent of your business is is cigar related uh, printing matter. Well, that's a big issue, huh? Mm -hmm. That's a big issue. We we have always been in a niche, so that's that's not my major concern. No, I mean China is coming up as well. So and there, are, there are quite a few people living there. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. John, most recently, and I don't know if you've been following the, the whole discussion about this, um, the topic of responsible marketing uh, created some, some true, um, true buzz and, uh, and excitement. Um, in a very ambiguous way in the industry when, when people were talking about, you know, are certain designs and certain artwork on cigars um, targeted towards uh, a younger clientele? Um, there was some innovative packaging with all sorts of candy involved and, uh, and other fancy stuff. And it uh, it created quite a bit of a of a storm in the industry because obviously it might uh, change the whole dynamic of, of regulatory issues and how the FDA yes. looks at, uh, yeah. at the industry as a whole. Do you have a, a, a perspective or a certain position on that? Um, how do you do you even see that in your own operations and certain requests that you get for for designs? No, those are not my clients. No, and I know what you're talking about. I've seen some uh, posts on uh, Instagram and people who get uh, really upset. Um, and and we all know that that uh, that the cigar industry is laying under a huge uh, magnifying glass. So 
and to look for those boundaries, I think it's a silly thing to do. I think it's a silly thing to do. I think there will always be a market for, uh, and I'm not a cigar guy, eh? who am I talking? Uh, but but there will always be a market for, 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 for uh, people who smoke cigars. But when you have to uh, pull, it, pull it towards your product in a matter that is or risky for everyone involved who only want to, yeah, want to do the job correctly and, and, and uh, want to do it safe and want to do it uh, without any flavors or, or, uh, or going slightly across the border. Well, that's a bit of a bummer. That's a bit of a bummer because eventually it, 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 it will all go. Um, well, the FDA is going to, it's going to, it's going to get tougher every year. And it will not only cherry pick those people who fucked up, it will go across the border. And that's, that's an issue. Very true. Yeah. And I don't know if there's a community as, as you were talking about uh, the, the, the designers, if there's, a, if there's a community uh, within the cigar uh, business, well, I know they get together a lot, uh, but, but, but what can you do about it? What can you do about the people who think they, they do a fair amount of business and they do a fair business when actually they are not and taking the risk for other companies as well? What, what can you do? And why would you put a, a whole industry at risk because of... Just for a quick buck. Just for a quick buck. Yeah. Very true. Yeah, that's something that cigar industry should should uh, yeah should form some sort of alignment or, or alliance. I must say, but yeah, I very much enjoyed how how you said those are not your clients and 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 your customers. How carefully do you choose and pick? The, the people that you work with and, and what, what are some of the individual characteristics and qualities that you look for with the people well, that you work with? To, to say it in a, in a, in a, uh, in a blunt uh, manner, uh, but very obvious, I don't work with assholes. So uh, <laughs> if, 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 uh, if I tend to feel that uh, someone is, is using me, uh, and I don't mind to share my knowledge and, 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 and that you use my knowledge and, and the technology we have here. Uh, when I don't like someone, I'm not going to go the extra mile to do the product that we are all proud of. So at the end, he will end up with something that, well, that, is, that I, I'm not going to put my name on. Uh, so why start to begin with? No. I need, I need to have some sort of some sort of uh, some sort of good click relationship with a customer to to go the extra mile. And that saying, uh, a lot of the people, well, all the people that I work with from the cigar industry are great people. And I also have the same with my suppliers. I, I have su suppliers who became friends over the years. And uh, that's that, that's what uh, what makes my job fun. And when the phone rings, I'm I'm never looking at oh it's, it's that asshole again. No, I never have that. And and that makes your work uh, yeah so much fun to do. Yeah. And I guess now more than ever, um, and especially for you as a multi generational family business, um, it's so much more important to carefully choose the people that you work with and very specifically focus on on values and, and, and shared beliefs with the people that you work with because it in 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 today's day and age unfortunately that's become a rare thing and we need to refocus and, and realign with those things that are so important like um, our dear friend uh, and fellow Jeremiah Maropful um, who is here with us uh, watching on, on Facebook um, oh he said, hey uh, Jeremiah 
<laughs> and <laughs> and in you know with his uh, tagline um, the uber tradition um, and and everything that his family stood for the values and the respect um, he rightfully said that the quality cannot be replaced with mediocrity and uh, you got to respect those those very important uh, values and actually he 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 specifically asked me to take a moment to to honor the barone of bands uh, from from the entire Merrillville family. So I think that is a beautiful testament to longstanding relationships, trust, and sharing the same values and beliefs that ultimately lead to wonderful collaborations and friendship. Absolutely, absolutely. So you, you got to choose wisely when uh, when it comes to. Uh clientele to uh, suppliers uh, to uh, colleagues because you're spending eight hours with them each day you eat with them you uh, have fun with them uh, it's a very uh, well Jeremiah has been here um, hereby I'm inviting you to come over here have a look then you see how big it is uh, so it's it's um, it's a very nice working space with a nice environment. The music is always on. Uh, so you need to have people around that you that you enjoy. That's 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 important. Um, and for me, I think it's to uh, try to stay happy with what we do, uh, and not saying every year. Like in big companies, okay, this year I want 3% more. Next year, 4% more. I mean, when I look back, when I take my old bills from, from, from 10, 20 years ago, when I, when I looked at what I, what I paid with things, that's all the result of companies wanting to scale up 3% every year. I mean, every 10 years, everything has become one third more expensive. And I'm eating the same amount of food. What the hell? I, 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 okay, so to me, the most important thing is to have fun with my job. And of course, I have to earn uh, an honest pay to pay my colleagues. And, and, uh, and every now and then you need a new guitar. So, hey, okay. <laughs> 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 you need a new bike and a new car. Okay, but no, serious. Uh, it, it, it doesn't always have to be like bum 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 we need to go up we need to go up we need to go up because when you always stretching that you're um you tend to forget what uh what you what you started it for mm -hmm. and still every day okay sometimes the, the 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 work level and uh um the, the paper issue is now is really becoming a big thing eh? well whether we can pay for uh, other paper or not but besides that all that shit i have no stress every day i'm whistling to work and that's uh, uh, the most important thing for me and it's, it's a matter of um, keeping your your business sustainable whilst at the same time focusing on sustainability on a on the individual level like you mentioned the papers um Actually, Alistair had a, had a great question over on Facebook. Um, he was curious about the, the sustainability aspect of paper supply. And you just mentioned that it's becoming more and more of an issue. Yeah. Are there any specific innovations with paper? Like uh, Alistair mentioned the greener hemp or papyrus or some other bamboo. innovative bamboo. approach yeah. that bamboo. Would probably guarantee a better supply and options for the future? Yeah, yeah, bamboo uh, is, is 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 being transformed to paper now uh, these days. They've been doing that a lot. But uh, listen, we we are uh, we're in a bumpy ride now, paper wise. Um, but always, someone will come up with a solution. Mm -hmm. If if we could buy paper uh, without any problems, no one would look for a solution. So every time somewhere there's a problem, someone will come up with a solution. At least I trust in the fact that there was someone that will came up with a solution. It always does. It always does. 
John, when, when you just said that you have music playing all the time whilst working, what is the soundtrack of Van Tintelen printing art when all the machines are rattling away? What tune do you put on? Well, it's basically just the radio that we have on. We have a popular station uh, which plays old tunes, but also the new stuff, because I want to know the new stuff as well. So uh, uh, I, uh, I, I go to concerts from, uh, from older people, but uh, Tuesday, my first concert again, yes, within two years, because of the COVID shit, everything was shut down. Uh, we have a real nice venue here called the Effenaar. There was a Dutch group called The Wolf. It's a Zeppelin-like Zeppelin, uh, band, so really. Uh, but I take my daughters to Lady Gaga as well. So uh, it's, it's very wide. It's very wide. I'm not going to take Lady... Uh, I'm not going to take my daughters uh, to Lady Gaga this year because the, the ticket has gone to the roof. In a couple of months, she is here in, in Holland, and one ticket costs $276. I don't know what, what, what she does in her act that is worth uh, two. <laughs> so, uh, no. John, I can tell you today, um, the tickets for the Rolling Stones coming to Vienna went on sale, and the prices are out of this world it's unbelievable um my my beloved lady got uh, some some tickets for the stones today but uh, the prices they were asking for were ridiculous um, so yeah well what did you pay for my house well it was uh, it was more than 200 for the individual <laughs> it, it was it was double that price to be honest okay okay yeah okay but listen um the stones Every time you go to the Stones, might be the last time. Eh? I mean, we are talking about uh, uh, that, uh, that smoking is bad for you. Uh, a booze is bad for you. Uh, I'm not into drugs, but drugs is bad for you. Uh, what do these guys stuffed up their nose and their gut knows where? And, and, and they're still alive. I've heard that every time that someone in the world uh, lights a cigarette, gives an extra year to Keith Richards. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there you go. But I can imagine that those tickets are really expensive because it might be the last time that you will see him. Yeah, very yeah. true. And yeah. it brings us back to you know everything we spoke about experience. Um, that's what it all comes down to, and that's what makes what makes life worthwhile. It's, it's not the money, uh, it's the experiences that, that, that you have and the experiences that you can share with other people, which is also why cigars are such a fascinating and, and wonderful thing because they bring us together and they provide us with the opportunity to, to have such memorable experiences and to share them with each other. Well, it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> it, life is hectic sometimes and um and when you smoke cigarettes uh th that's an addiction uh and your body needs to smoke uh i've just been a, on a short uh, ski holiday um uh, and i every now and then I, I i smoke a cigarette and on holidays i smoke a lot of cigarettes and every time you're down the hill oh smoke a cigarette which is which is stupid but when you when you smoke a cigar you, you choose a moment to do that and that, yeah that's uh, with, a, with a nice glass of wine or, or or whiskey or whatever do you prefer and sit down with nice people very true and have good conversation absolutely and you need to because this thing is pushing over an hour now so you really have to <laughs> need some something uh, interesting to talk about john if if you as a person and you with your work as a professional if you would have to compare that with a particular tune or a style of music what would be the soundtrack of john Ventinton? oh my god oh my god 
Uh, I'm, I'm loving so uh, Kashmir. Kashmir, let's have a Yeah. Great choice. Yeah. Now, John, I think everybody, I think everybody knows Kashmir. I, I don't need to explain that. Just put on your headphone, crank the motherfucker up, and then you know what I'm talking about. There's certain yep. things you you do not have to explain. You you just have to experience it. John, it's been fantastic to to share uh, such precious time with you and to to learn more about your family operation and all the wonderful detail, finesse, and craftsmanship that go into every single cigar ring. And I, I truly hope that with today's session and interview, we could inspire some people to probably the next time you light up a cigar, take a moment and don't try to just rip the, the ring apart and throw it into the the, the bin bag or the, the ashtray, but, but focus on it and... Uh, appreciate and enjoy the, the art and the finesse and detail that goes into every single ring because it truly is part of the overall experience. And um, these are very special products. Uh, I always say a cigar is never just a cigar. It's, uh, it's an experience and it's a, a window to the heart and soul of the people behind it. Everybody who puts the blood, sweat, and tears, as we always say, and then the passion into it. And the very same is true for everything that you do. And I, I cannot congratulate and, and thank you enough for everything that you do there. And it, it is most greatly appreciated. Well, uh, the pleasure was all mine, I, uh, I must say. Uh, I'm just doing what I've been doing for you know, more than over uh, <laughs> 35 years. So, um, well, more. I'm getting old. So uh, to me, it's just uh, business as usual. And uh, this is all new to me. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I hope to uh, may receive you here one day so you can see with your own eyes how it all comes about. Probably much sooner than, than we can. I've heard I some think. rumors. I've heard <laughs> some rumors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and, um, and that leads me to, um, you know, the, the end of today's show. Um, you, you probably all know that um, in four days from now, Light em Up will celebrate its second birthday. And we had uh, over two million views now over these years. Um, thousands and uh, thousands of people who joined us and, and watched our shows. And I'm eternally grateful for, for all the community and the support and the camaraderie and uh, Next Wednesday, I will be on vacation and uh, we will have a very special get together and a very special show to celebrate our second anniversary. Um, John, it was such a pleasure um, just before the, 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 the two year mark to, to spend time with you and, and share some of your craft and some of your experience. I have one final question now that you mentioned um, your 35 or 30 plus years in, in the industry. And again, uh, taking the, the music analogy if you think about your life and your professional career and and you were to think of it as a, as a song where in that song do you feel like you you are currently is it the uh, the second chorus is it, uh, is it oh. the bridge or where, where do you feel like you are at this moment in time well i think i'm in the bridge at the beginning of the bridge and the end comes out with a bang that's I think the perfect. outro will be a big bang. That's what I think. Exactly how it should be. John Van Tiltelen, thank you so much for this uh, most enjoyable and, and absolutely precious moment. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us at the Light Em Up Lounge. It's been an absolute pleasure. Pleasure was all mine. Thank you. Thank you. All the very best to, to all of you. Have a wonderful rest of your day and we'll see you again next week here at the Light em Up Lounge. Until then, you be safe, be well, and always light them up. Thank you. All right. You. Bye, Bye, everybody.